Hey guys, Drifter here. Welcome to Advanced Warfare In Depth. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about skill-based matchmaking. I've spent the better part of the last three days trying to figure out how skill-based matchmaking works, and yesterday I finally did it. I have an answer, I have a solution. I will, in this video, explain to you how skill-based matchmaking works, who it matches you against, and how it's going to impact your connection. If you're looking for a short, simple TLDR, an X does Y, a one or two sentence explanation, you really need to look somewhere else because this is something complicated, it's not necessarily straightforward, and I have a lot of explanation to do before we get to those answers, but there will be answers in this video. I'm just, I plead with you to stick with it and watch the whole thing instead of just skipping around looking for the explanation. So the first thing I want to start off with is a couple of facts about skill-based matchmaking. A couple of things we know to be certain true facts that are completely indisputable, and we'll start off with number one. Skill-based matchmaking exists. It's in the game, it's in the code, we've seen the lines of code, we can casually observe its effects, we know it's there, and we know that it does something. We can observe the effects, we know something's going on, I actually tested it, I'm going to prove that it does something later on, but, but we know that. Some people would debate that it doesn't exist, etc, etc, that's not true, it's clearly here. Uh, the question eventually becomes, how strong is it? Does it match you with really hard players all the time? And does it impact the connections in the game? That's what we're looking at here today, and that's where we're going to be going. The next thing we know is that skill-based matchmaking also existed in Black Black Ops 2 and Ghost. It is not new or unique to Advanced Warfare. This was completely in Black Ops 2 and was in Ghost. You can go look, you can go rip the machine code from those and look at that or dig way back into some, you know, past archived Google searches and you will find that it exists in those games. We also know that literally nobody knows how this works except for devs. And this is where this is why I've made the video and why I've run into so many problems. Everybody thinks skill-based matchmaking bases you on kill death ratio or win loss ratio or score per minute or some invisible elo or this and that and I've played a couple of games here and I got hard players and then I reverse boosted and I got bad players or if I set my prestige to this number instead of that number literally nobody knows we have casual observations uh, we have people that think they know and your anecdotal experiences with this are completely worthless things like Bigfoot alien abductions homeopathic medicines dream catchers and ionic power band bracelets are all best based on anecdotal experience and when it comes to actual science and, and data that's that's all useless and that's why I'm trying to change this today to, pre to present some actual data and we also know that matchmaking is not 100% skill based matchmaking driven we know that it, it does of course consider connection nat type region all these other sort of things otherwise the game would be beyond unplayable and I know many of you feel that the game is unplayable now due to skill based matchmaking but if there were no considerations for connection you would be in a whole new level of hell you probably wouldn't even connect to most lobbies due to the nat type problems that that, that we have, you know, some nat types just can't communicate with each other, so you just be kicked out all the time. And lastly, we know from a previous video that I did, which uh, I, I ended up taking down for different reasons, is that skill-based matchmaking is driven by dozens of variables. There are There is like something like almost 20-something variables in skill-based matchmaking. Uh, like, there, there's just tons and tons of variables. Not all of them were labeled. Uh, some were from past games, some were from this game, some considered your party, enemies, uh, all sorts of, there's like a ton of variables. Unfortunately, we can't look at all of them. We can only take a look at a couple of them because only a couple of them are public. And I chose public data because we can't get non-public data without hacking, and that's a big no-no. And because I want to make an experiment that all of you can replicate, where if you want to do this on your own, we you can do that. So, And besides, it matches up really well with the popular theories and how skill-based matchmaking works. Uh, a lot of people feel that skill-based matchmaking works based on prestige. The higher prestige you are, the harder enemies you get. It matches you based on kill-death ratio, in that, you know, like 2 or 3 KD players are going to usually match with 2 and 3 KD players whereas like one or like you know less than one like 0.5 players or whatever are going to match with lesser KD players essentially se separating the elite from the from the not so elite and based on win loss ratio this one goes more like an elo system when I hear it is that you know if you win a lot in a certain game type it puts you in progressively harder lobbies or something like that and that your win loss ratio is more important than your kill death ratio because that shows more skill or score per minute that you know really high score per minute indicates that you're a team player that you're on these objectives uh, that you're definitely doing 
doing something all the time, you might not necessarily be killing people, and you might not necessarily win the game because you have bad teammates, but you're contributing really well with score per minute. Unfortunately, score per minute is not a publicly available stat that I could look up really easily, so we didn't uh, study those. Instead, I focused on prestige, kill death ratio, and win loss ratio. Uh, I tested this for 20 different people in three random matches each. I made a big thread on Reddit, and I basically asked people to send sc to send screenshots of three random matches and their stats page, and I, I looked all this up to make sure they weren't cheating and stuff. Uh, basically, they each did three matches in three different game types, and then I went and looked at the pictures of those matches that they sent in and used a little website that lets me look up anybody's stats in Call of Duty to type in the gamer tags of every single person in each of those three matches for those 20 people, and they recorded their kill-death ratio, win-loss ratio, and prestige, and this took absolutely forever. That's, uh, I mean, just, just think about how many times I had to search a crazy gamer tag. It came out to be a little bit over 500 total gamer tags searched and lobbies aggregated and put together. I didn't do it solo. I had help from J-Hub. I had help from Astro. I had help from uh, Fox the Don, and I also had help from z or Clay. I had other people help me put this data together. Otherwise, there's no way I would have been able to do it. But basically, I got 20 people, and I wanted to see if either their kill-death ratio, win-loss ratio, or their prestige was a good uh, predictor of how they were being matched. And again, I'd like to have gotten like 2,000 people, but it took me three days just to punch in this little bit of data. I, I really couldn't stomach doing too much more. After I got all the data, I was able to put it together and make a scatter graph, and then with the scatter graph you can plot a trend line, which I'm showing you right now is the total prestige matchmaking. This is a graph of how good of a predictor your prestige level is against the prestige level of your enemies, and that red line is the trend line. Uh, basically you can see that it's almost flat, and that means that there is nearly no trend, and our R-squared value is 0 .0004. That's extremely low. We're going to be talking about this R-squared value a lot. If you're not not super hot at statistics, don't worry about it. The R-square value is just a number that tells you how good your trend line is at predicting the data by the little scatter graph. Basically, the, the closer that number is to 1, the better predictor it is. And generally speaking, anything over 0.5 to 0.6 or 7 is considered a good predictor for anything that has human behavior and not like a, a, a natural science or something like that. But at this tiny, tiny number, it means that prestige has absolutely no effect on matchmaking whatsoever. Just absolutely None. And that's not really surprising, because Prestige was not, a, in my opinion, a very good predictor of skill. Not very many people considered it a good predictor of skill. Just time played, maybe overall experience, and uh, so that wasn't very surprising. Let's look at kill-death ratio, because this is the really popular one, and this is where we're going to spend most of the time in the episode. So next up, I decided to plot the kill-death ratio of the player against the average kill-death ratio of the lobbies that they're in. And I, I felt like I should explain this a little bit. I did not do it against the average of all players because I found that when I compared the average of all players to the average kill-death ratio of the lobbies, that the lobbies were consistently about the same kill-death ratio, meaning that matchmaking was treating the lobby as a block of KDs and kind of averaging them and matching you to the lobby and not necessarily to each or any one of the individual players. So I took the lobbies, averaged them to get the kill-death ratios, and compared them to the kill-death ratios of the players that were matched in those lobbies and plotted that together. So it's basically your KD against enemy KD if you want to think about it. And what I found is that that your total kill-death ratio matchmaking is not a very good predictor of how you're going to be matched. Now, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, so do bear with me. Uh, my trend line, or my R-square, is 0 0.16, meaning that it didn't, it didn't actually match very well, which was kind of surprising because casually looking at it, it appeared to match great. And if you look at this graph, you'll notice something funny about it. You'll notice that we have a couple of anomalous points. We have one on the y-axis all the way up there at 1.8, and then the guy on, that has the uh, 6 kill death ratio. The player kill death ratio is on the bottom and your lobby is on the left hand side. I'm just terrible at uh, and making things on Excel. You'll notice that these really skew the data, and you'll also notice that we have a really good trend on the left-hand side, a really solid kind of linear relationship until we hit about 2.0 KD, and then it all goes to pot. And uh, a bad statistician, a bad scientist, would take these anomalous data points, pluck them out, throw them away, and then plot something and be like, look how great our graph is, but that's bad science. Science doesn't really work that way, that's cheating. 
Instead, I decided to try a polynomial trend line because we all like linear relationships, they're easier to understand, but maybe a polynomial one was better because the data that I got was indicating that as your kill-death ratio gets greater than two or three, that you're actually going to get proportionally easier lobbies with the exception of this one guy that kept getting harder lobbies. And it was giving me some really kind of crazy data and I didn't really understand this, but the polynomial trend line matched much better. It told me that was a, you know, a predictor of about 0.57, meaning like 57% of that was explained by kill death ratio and I, I liked that but I was thinking you know nobody in their right mind would program something like this this isn't making very much sense nobody would intentionally give easier lobbies as your kill death ratio went up and that's when I started thinking about matchmaking and the player based population and I realized that I needed to look at this kind of like a normal curve like kind of like a bell curve or normal distribution and that what I'm doing here is actually not 100% correct so we're getting closer to that answer you've all been waiting for but first I'm going to do a a brief uh, introduction to bell curves for all of those that haven't seen that. I just generated this graph randomly on Excel. Don't worry about the y-axis, just look at the bottom. That's basically kill-death ratios from zero to uh, about two right there, and it's, it's essentially bell curve shape. Most people are going to have about a 1.0 KD. If you average all the KDs in the game, it'll be about, it'll be about one. Technically, it'll be like 0.98 or something because people commit suicide, but want to be close enough, and there's less and less people with bad KDs and less and less people with really amazing KDs, and that makes total sense. Most of us are, are familiar with this bell curve, uh, you know, kind of th theory. We do this in school, and you also probably know that like 75% of players are going to be in this kind of middle area. I did this plus or minus about 0.3 or about 0.4 KD from the center, and most players are going to be right here in the middle, and less players are going to be on the ends on either side. That makes total sense. I'm sure most of you understand this is getting really boring. I'm going to move on. For my particular study, I had nobody to study really less than about 0.4 KD because these people are so bad, they're super casual, they get smashed, they don't play again, they're not the hardcore types, they're not on Reddit, they're not on YouTube, they're not on Twitter, so I didn't have anybody down in this end to study. I wish I would have because I probably would have gotten similar data. But uh, what I did realize is that, by looking at that, that a bell curve for kill death ratios in Call of Duty is not going to be perfectly normal. It's going to be something that we call log normal. And if you look at this graph, you'll notice that it's a little bit different on the right hand side. I'm going to do a zoom in here just to show you. So this is the normal distribution graph. It goes down to zero at about 0.2. A log normal one isn't going to quite do that. It's going to logarithmically increase, uh, go towards zero. And it's going to go on for a long, 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 long time. It's got a long tail. I just wanted to show you uh, again, so kill death ratios are log normal. They're not perfectly normal because a perfectly normal graph you would end up with like if, if a guy had a kill death ratio of two, somebody else would have to have a kill death ratio of like negative two and that doesn't work. It would be like 0.025 or 0.5 or something like that. And the higher your kill death ratio gets, the closer the other one go, approaches zero, which is a normal log normal distribution. You know, I'm getting way off track here. Essentially, only about 5% of total players are going to be above this, this little area here. I call that about 1.75 KD. And about 5% of players are going to be in this area over here on the right hand side. Not a whole lot of people, which means there's not a whole lot of people for them to match with. And what that means is that players over a 2.0 KD could not find good skill matches with 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 connections like they could they could they couldn't find skilled matches with good enough connections to satisfy the matchmaking needs because we know that Call of Duty does two things it tries to match you based on good connections and it tries to match you fast like Call of Duty is not a game where you wait five hours to get a match it's not a game where you wait all day you click the button you go play it's really simple that's one of the things that made the game what it is and because it could not find a good match it was actually putting these good players into low were KD lobbies. It would search, it would say, okay, we can't find it, we'll lower their uh, standards until we find them a lobby. So high KD players only occasionally get put into equal skill matchups, which explains why I had one guy that was getting really high um, you know, KD matches and all the rest of them were getting really bad ones, but then even inside that we had really high variations. That's because there's just only a tiny percentage of players that ever get above about a 2.0 KD and that once you hit that range that, that you just, there's not enough people to match with. They're all split up, they're all doing different things, they're in different lobbies, they're in bad regions, etc, etc, and you can't match with them. So what I decided to do is maybe I'll take a look at kill death matching for players less than 2 K KD and when I did that, I get this really awesome trend line here with an R-square value 
of about 0.88. I, I round a little bit, but it's that's a really high R square value. That's one that more closely mimics like a physical or like natural occurrence phenomena than it does a player behavior or human being. So that's a really strong one. And what that means is if your kill death ratio is less than two, the game is usually going to match you with a lobby at about the same kill death ratio, or at least that it tries to. And that's a really strong predictor right there. I want to make that really clear that that is a really, really good match. And I'm going to say that kill death ratio is the best predict predictor of lobby matches up to about 2.0 KD. And that the range of this uh, per person in the match is about plus or minus 0.4. So like if you have a 1 KD, you'll play people that have a 0.6 and a 1.4. If you have like a 1.5 KD, you'll play anywhere, anybody in the range from about 1.1 up to about, you know, 1.9. You've got a pretty wide range here, meaning that there will be good and bad players in almost every lobby. So don't think you're being forced to play sweaty tryhards or that the matching is so extreme that literally everybody in the lobby is going to have your same KD. That's not true at all. This is a lobby average, and there's big variations inside the average. We should also probably take a look at total win-loss matchmaking, and we see a pretty similar story. Uh, we see this, this trend line here kind of going on, but with some anomalous data points, and it didn't match very well. But if I do total win-loss matchmaking under 3.0, I get a much stronger trend of about 39. Our square value is about 0.39, which means that win-loss is factored in somehow. That's part of this. It's a pretty good predictor of who you're going to get matched with up to a certain point. And then after that point, it's all going to be random because there's nobody to properly match with. And now we're getting to the point part of the in-depth episode. I know I've been swallowing and stuff here. I'm a little bit sick today. And I will say that the, ma the vast majority of players will match with each other. If you remember that little thing, the vast majority of people are grouped around the middle. And we've got pretty big variations of the type of person in each lobby and where you can be matched with. And I'm going to say that probably about 90-ish percent of players can match with each other very, very easily given this kind of distribution. It's not, um, it's not strict or harsh or anything. And it's still a really huge sample size to choose a good host from. So if you're like 90% of players, you're going to have a whole ton of good hosts because there is a whole ton of people playing Call of Duty. And that skill-based matchmaking, therefore, is unlikely to cause significant changes in host quality because you've still got a huge player base to pull a good host from and you've got a really wide percentage of the population to look inside the player base for. So it's not likely to hurt, you know, make you lag or anything like that. However, by its definition, it will still affect host quality by some small amount. It's theoretically possible that there could be a lobby of really bad kids out there with like 0.5 KDs that all match with each other and they have the best host ever and it chose not to put you in that one because you just smashed them it would be an unfair but you also have to realize that the exact opposite is also true that there could be a lobby of like 4.0 KD pub stars and pro players out there that have a really good connection and it decided that, you know what, you're not good enough to play in that lobby we want to we want to keep you from getting absolutely shrecked so we're not going to put you in there but again these will be very rare occurrences that that it would it would do that i really wouldn't expect it to like nuke connections like you think about also you won't even get matched with better than average players until you hit about 1.4 kd Anywhere close to 1 KD, even on slightly positive side, since we have a very big range, you're still going to be playing pretty normal players up until you hit about 1.4. At that range, you're going to get more better players than bad players, and that's just, that's kind of the limit. Also, you won't get matched with sweaty tryhards until about 2.0 KD, and that's really high. Like, that's, that's the range at which all the tryhards kind of come out. That's where you get the really the good players, and it won't even try to match you with people of that caliber until about 2KD. At about that range, it's going to get harder, but if you get anything above that range, you're going to get matched with Randy's because there's not enough people to play. So, like, once you hit about 2.0 KD, it will occasionally put you in god lobbies, but then more frequently than not put you in bad lobbies because there's nobody on to match you with. Uh, other kind of things, reverse boosting will probably work. If you lower your kill-death ratio, you'll probably get lesser lobbies, but you'll get banned for doing this because it's gaming the system. And if reverse boosting makes you an asshole, there's no room to argue about it. If you reverse boost, you're an asshole. There's, there's, there's really no way to look at it except the selfish way. Some people say, you know, I don't want to have to play hard every game. I want to go play bad kids. I want to play the worst people possible. And that might be really fun for you as an individual, but that's really shitty for the other 11 people that you're playing. And I don't like to curse a lot in end up, but I'm doing it here today. 
Like, buying the game for $60 did not guarantee that you get to play the worst people imaginable on the planet. And reverse boosting in order to make sure that you play the worst people imaginable so you can beat up on them and feel good about yourself makes you a complete asshole. That your little bit of happiness is more important than that of the 11 other people. And if you're like, well, you know what, I don't know these people, so screw them, then you're still an asshole. And reverse boosting makes you a huge asshole, and I don't want to hear about it. Lastly, uh, getting a super high kill death ratio will actually get you into bad lobbies and lobbies far, you know, less competitive than where you are in the game. And I actually think that's a better strategy than reverse boosting because you can reverse boost your account down and then it'll go back up. But as long as you keep a really high KD, and I saw this in the data, you'll pretty consistently get bad lobbies. I know that sounds counter and, you know, crazy to anything we've ever done, but it's true that if you want bad lobbies, get your kill death ratio above two and most of the lobbies will be bad. You'll get a few tryhards, but I'd say it's probably about five or six to one tryhard to bad. That's all for this in-depth episode. I know it was super long. I hope you learned something. The previous episode was on the Obsidian Steed. I think I'm doing, I'm kind of push publishing this one out of order. And the next one, we're going to be talking about dedicated servers and lag issues. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.